I, um, I come to you tonight wounded after Brody made fun of my fashion choices. But I got to be honest with you, when uh, at 56 years of age, my fashion is based on three things. Number one, that it doesn't itch. Number two, that it stretches. And number three, that it's comfortable. Amen. So I don't care if you like my shoes or not, they're comfortable, all right? Uh, but man, I tell you, the first time I met Brody, uh, I had a friend of mine that was deer hunting with me in Rome, Georgia, and it was supposed to come about three or four inches of snow the next morning. And he said, hey, I got a friend that we need to call in to, uh, to help us because I was telling him it was doe day the next day. And, uh, and man, we need some help killing some deer. And he said, well, I got a buddy of mine who says that he, en he enjoys hunting. I said, well, does he enjoy hunting or does he love to kill? And he said, well, he, I, I think both. I said, well, call him and, and see if he wants to come down and help me kill some deer. Uh, I, I, I love to hunt, but I love to kill, okay? <laughs> and he came down, and, man, it was it's dumping snow, and we, we're shooting deer, man. We're laying them out there. It's, it's just a massacre. I hope none of you are with PETA. But, uh, <laughs> man, man we, were, we were smoking them that morning. It was awesome. And, and I, I hear Brody. And, and he had shot a couple of times, and then I had crossed over a hill, and Brody had put his rifle down, and he had crawled out on a limb that was about this big around with his pistol, and he's looking at me, and he's doing this, and he's looking down the hill, and there's some deer down there that he couldn't see from the stand, so he crawls out on a limb. <laughs> and he's hanging there with a pistol, and we're mowing deer down. We had a truckload of about six or eight deer, and we finally, we get to the uh, processor, because I didn't want to clean that many, and we got to the processor, and the guy says, now, where'd you kill all these does? I said, right here in Floyd County. He said, it's not doe day in Floyd County. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, it's, it's doe day in Floyd County. I, I've read the book. I called this guy out of Andrews, North Carolina, to come be with me. I know it's doe day. He said, I'm telling you, sir, it's not doe day. I said, get your book. And he got the book, and he came over, and he said, Forsyth County, not Floyd County. Now, I'm going to ask you one time, where'd you kill these deer? I said, Forsyth County. I've been saying that the last three times. <laughs> so Brody said, man, that was good. That was, I knew we were on the same page hunting, hunting when, uh, when he joined hands with me on that deal. <laughs> and if, if, man, if you're a game warden, I'm sorry. I, listen, <laughs> that was over 10 years ago, so Statue of Limitations has us safe. You just need to know that. Man, I love Brody Holloway. I love Little. I love his family. I love Snowbird because Snowbird has invested in my children. My daughter is on the mission field today as a result of the ministry of Snowbird Wilderness Outfit. They, uh, she married a boy by the name of Bobby Lane, who I, we ran into when I was doing ministry in Millington, Tennessee, just north of Memphis, about 10 or 12 miles and uh, if you look under the word unbridled exuberance in the dictionary, you'll see his picture. He's there. But they, uh, they were missionaries uh, in, in uh, Uganda for four years and in uh, Kampala and then up in uh, Kabong. And if you ever get a chance to go to Kabong, you need to. It's not third world Africa. It's first century Africa. It's the most beautiful place I've ever been in the middle of nowhere. And uh, then they moved into the southern Sudanese or southern Sudan and did some ministry there came home for a little while, and now they are in Chad, Africa. My wife is on a plane as we speak, and she is, uh, she is headed back home. She was there with Bobby and Meredith and two of my grandbabies. My two, two of my grandbabies, they're Shepard and Roscoe. Y'all pray uh, for Roscoe. Roscoe's a turd. <laughs> <coughs> All capital letters. And, and I'm grateful that he is. His, his mother deserves to see what it was like to raise one of those. And then my son is here, Brian. Uh, Brian is my, my oldest. He's 36. He's given me three grandchildren, Aniston, who's nine. And then we have Roman, who's three or four, four. And then Neelan, who's working on two real hard and uh, real hard. And uh, my kids, like any of y'all who have kids, they're totally different. I'll never forget Brian. Uh, he's always been my laid back one. He was so late for his delivery that they had to use head pliers to get that joker out. But when they got him out, his face was all botched up and bruised up, but he, he was a beautiful baby, seven and a half pounds. Then Meredith came along. She was birthed in about six seconds flat. When she came out, she slapped her own behind, <laughs> tipped the doctor and said, thanks for your help, and, dude, she was on her way. 
She was 10 and a half pounds and the ugliest baby you've ever seen on planet Earth. I'm not lying. She's ugly. Now, my wife and I, if a baby, we don't go around, oh, that baby's beautiful. If they're ugly, we say they're ugly, okay? Now, she grew to be beautiful real quick. But I am, again, eternally grateful, Brody, to you and many of you guys who've been around for a long time at Snowbird. You poured into my daughter. and You helped her become who she is. My son-in-law helped him become who he is. And for that, I am indebted to you for life. So, uh, for, so thank you. I was sharing with Brody. We were sitting out in the middle of a field that's completely open, 700 yards, 800 yards from one side to another, and we're in this little island of trees this past spring or fall and in the winter, and, and there's doe that are coming out, and we're, it looked like a Confederate war. There were deer laying everywhere. We were just mowing them down and having a great time. And I was sharing with him how God, I sang for 13 years on the road in music evangelism with a contemporary Christian music group. And when I was on the road, evangelism was my heart, man. And when I came off the road and began to pastor, one thing that I really began to have a heart for is discipleship. And I had spent a lifetime discipling people. But one of the things that I, I think I fell real short in is discipling people to become disciple makers. Does that make sense? Tonight, I don't want to just disciple you. I want us to be prepared to become disciple makers, to take somebody under your wing, to do for somebody else what Brody and Snowbird has done for my daughter and for my son. I want to see us walk out of here and become more passionate about being disciple makers than we've ever been in our lives. We're talking about in Adam, in Christ tonight, in Adam, the old nature, in Christ, the new creation. But I want to talk to you about what it means to be a dangerous and daring disciple. What, what does it mean to become dangerous and daring? People universally fight for strength and power, and they're always seeking to force other people to bend to their will. This is nothing new. Jesus dealt with this when he, was, when he, when he writes the Word of God. In my, Mark chapter 9, take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 9. We're going to be all over the Word tonight. And I want you to be ready to turn. Uh, we'll just call it Christian aerobics, okay? This is your exercise. Jesus is hanging out with his boys. And while he's hanging out with them, they, they start talking about who is the greatest among them. And Jesus, you know, is chuckling on the inside. Because one thinks he's better than the other. And Jesus is about to set him straight. And he's talking here, again, to his disciples. And he's teaching them some principles on what it's going to take to be a dangerous and daring disciple. And here's what he says in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. He says, and he, that being Jesus, sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of of all. So he said, when Jesus spoke to them, he says, if, conditional term here. Now, sal salvation, listen, is not conditional. You just got to reach out and receive the gift. But here is a conditional term. If you want to be a d dangerous and daring disciple and you want to be at the front of the line, then you've got to start by moving yourself to the back of the line and begin to wash the people's feet at the rear of the line. This is what it's going to take, he's saying. So clearly what we're seeing here is that strength doesn't come through influence and, and we don't get it through grit or, or, or sheer determination, but strength comes only through surrender to Jesus Christ. I want you to say that with me. Strength comes only through surrender to Jesus Christ. That's the only way strength's going to come. We're not going to grit it out. We're not going to make it happen. We're not going to manipulate it. But when we surrender and we get to the back of the line, Jesus begins to do something in us that causes us to become the most dangerous and daring disciples of all time. Take your Bibles and turn with me quickly to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. The key focal point tonight for us is going to be that we have to practice surrender rather than commitment. 
I'm going to say it again. We have to practice surrender rather than commitment. Now, I'm not trying to be semantical there. I'll get back with you on the, on the meanings of those in just a minute. But 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And you say, okay, Phil, that, that's great. Uh, what's the difference between the commitment and the surrender? Let, let me share a brief story to bring you to the meaning of this word. In Romania, shortly after God brought spiritual revival to the nation which had liberated them from this cruel um, communist government, one of the leaders in that revival's name was Joseph Thiessen. And one of the things that made this man this mighty war warrior that he was was his exercise of, of kingdom authority. He knew how to exercise kingdom authority. And Joseph suffered greatly at the hands of the communists. He was brutally beaten. He was imprisoned. There were death threats on himself, on his family, on and on it goes. And it's here that he learned that victory comes when you surrender to the Savior. <clears throat> In describing American Christianity, Joseph used the words commitment. Now, what we would probably say is great. That's great. But no, it's not what Joseph meant. It wasn't great when he described American Christianity, he wasn't using the word commitment as a good term. As a matter of fact, he said that the word commitment didn't come into great usage in English language until the 1960s. And in Romania, they don't even have a word that translates for the word commitment. Joseph said, surrender is different. And he uses this illustration. He said, if someone holds a gun to your head and tells you to put up your hands over your head and surrender, what we don't ask is, so, sir, what are you committed to? What we do is we stop and we stick our hands over our head and surrender. We Americans love commitment because it still leaves us in control. Anybody in here struggle with control? We're men. Sure we do. Most everybody in here is struggling with it or has struggled with it. The key word that we've got to take hold of here is surrender. We are to be slaves of Jesus Christ. Certainly there are, are, are many things that we are committed to that are, that are godly things, they're wholesome things, but nothing takes the place of absolute surrender. Now grab this. Webster's Dictionary defines commitment as an act of putting into charge or to trust. So it's an act of us putting into charge or into trust. But surrender is an action of yielding one's person, of giving up possession of something into the power of another. So here it is. Let me simplify it. When we're committed, we're in control. When we surrender, we relinquish control. Surrender comes when we actually take action in obedience. Now, I want you just to listen to this verse. You don't have to turn there. You can write it down. Titus chapter 1, verse 1. Paul says, he, Paul, a bondservant, everybody say bondservant, bondservant. Of, of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness. Paul's saying he's God's doulos and Jesus apostle. Here's what he's saying. He's saying, I'm God's servant or slave, and I'm the one sent forth by Jesus. So if we're going to surrender, it's then we become slaves, bond servants of Jesus Christ, and we get to the back of the line and we begin to serve, and it's there we become the most dangerous and daring disciple of all time. Jesus is the greatest example when he stops to wash his disciples' feet. We're talking about the Messiah in the flesh that has come to die for the sin of mankind who stoops to wash the, feet of, the very feet of the people who will curse him. Some will deny him. Some will turn on him. But he stops to serve these very people. Take your Bibles now and turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to show you a picture of exactly what I'm talking about to bring us to the point of tonight. Like Adam, like Christ. Jonah, chapter 1. Man, you talk about a strong, bullheaded joker right here. We're about to read about one. Jonah, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, 
Arise, go to Nineveh, that, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come upon me, or come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Let me stop right there. How many of us, God has told us to do something, and we stood and we fled? Can I see your hand? The rest of you lying. There has been times in your life you know he's asked you to do something and you didn't do it. We've all been there, so nobody's beating anybody up here. Man, Jonah made the book, and Jonah did it. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Man, he not only made the book, God calls him out in the book, doesn't he? I told you to do something. You not only didn't, you paid your way to run as far from me as you could run. <coughs> Flip to chapter 3. Let's pick up on the story. Verse 1, Jonah chapter 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. <laughs> Has the Lord ever come to you more than once? <coughs> Boy, I told you. Boy, I told you. Came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah arose and sent to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. So notice in Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, Jonah decided not to follow God. He decided, God, I'm not going to do it your way. I'm going to run from you. But we get to chapter 3, verse 3, and Jonah surrendered and did something even though it was something he didn't want to do and even later would regret doing. He, led, he preached the book, people get saved, and now he's ticked about it. <coughs> God, I don't even like these people. <coughs> I didn't want them to get saved. But I came because you called me to rise up and go. There's going to be times that God calls us as men to do stuff that we don't want to do, but it's as simple as Brody said. We just simply got to get up and do it. It's not about how we feel. Listen, I don't wake up every day feeling Christian, do you? I don't feel like acting like one anyhow. Brody don't either. Obviously, he gets on the plane and don't even want to look at the guy. I've been there. My, my wife and I were going to see Meredith. Uh, no, my wife was already there, their first baby born, Shepherd, and we left the church. I just preached, fellas. We got in the van to go to Atlanta with my mom. My mom was 76 at the time, 75, and I was going to take her. She'd never probably get another trip out of the country. And we get in, and we have to go by through Cartersville, and we had to stop to pick up a guy. And uh, I thought, what is this dude doing? He's standing outside smoking a cigarette. I'm thinking, if you want to smoke yourself in the cancer ward, I'm not mad at you, but I'm ready to get to the airport. Let's go. And my mom said, you need to be patient, Phil. He may need Jesus. And I looked my mother straight in the face. I said, well, you and Jesus worked that out. I'm tired right now. He gets in, and he said, he lean, I'm praying he gets in the back of the van, but he sits right behind us, and he leans forward. And he said, where are y'all going? I said, going to Africa to see my daughter. Where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to Wyoming to do some pipe fitting. I'm a union pipe fitter, and there's no work around here. I said, are you from Cartersville? He said, no, I'm from Rome, Georgia. I said, well, that's interesting. Where did you go to school? He said, Coosa High School, even more interesting. That's where I went. I said, what year did you graduate? He said, 1980, even more interesting. That's when I graduated. I said, what's your name? He turned around, he looked at me, he said, Phil Wade. I said, Frankie Witt. He said, Phil, we used to steal beer together and wreck golf carts. <laughs> I went, Frankie, shh, that's my mama. <laughs> I've hid that from her for 50 years, Frankie, and, you, uh, uh, and you, you blew it. Listen, sometimes God's going to put you right in the middle of doing something you don't want to do. <laughs> Frankie Witt that day prayed to receive Jesus Christ as his Savior. He said, what are you doing now? And I told him, he said, what got you doing that? I said, Jesus, man, let me tell you the story. Let me tell you the story. And Frankie and I used to, sure enough, we, we smoked more weed than they could bring across the border. We drank more beer than you, than you could. We stole it from the clubhouse at the pro shop that his father worked at. And he said, man, God did a work in your life. I said, and he wants to do the same work in you. So here Jonah, he didn't want to surrender. And at first he didn't. But then he surrendered, though he still didn't want to. And he went where he really didn't want to go. He simply went because God had called him to go there. But in contrast 
to Jonah's story, I want you to listen to Mary's story. Luke chapter 1, verse 38. Y'all wore out from turning yet? Okay, I didn't think so. I'm driving at a point, so stay with me. Luke chapter 1, verse 38. The Bible says, Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. She said, Let it be according to your word. Whatever you say, I embrace it, I accept it, let it be so. Maid servant or handmaid in this text is the feminine version of the word doulos, which is the same word that we used earlier when Paul was saying that he was a bond servant. Surrender. It means he's God's servant. She was God's servant. God, because he's God, listen, can send us anywhere, whenever, and however he wants to. But what he's looking for is men who are simply willing and desiring to go. Many of us today are not moving forward because we're paralyzed with fear that we'll not be able to accomplish what God's going to call us to accomplish. Y'all look this way. If he can use a jackass in the Bible, and he still does today because I'm standing before you, then surely he can use you. He doesn't need qualified people. He needs people who are simply willing to say yes. Simply willing to surrender. Becoming a dangerous and daring disciple doesn't come by way of commitment. Listen to me. It comes by way of surrender. Commitment like Adam. Can can you imagine how many people run around beating themselves up because they've raised their children in the church year after year after year after year, and then they go prodigal, and they wonder what they did wrong. Sometimes we do wrong. I did. I'll share some of that with you in a minute. But perfect God creates two perfect children, Adam and Eve, places them in a perfect environment, and they rebel on him. So if God can create perfect children that rebel, sir, understand that you may have children that rebel against you. I don't care wh- how much right you teach them, they can, still, they, they, they can still rebel. Why, Phil? Because we live in a fallen world. Thank you, Adam and Eve, for their sin. And because of their sin, we now live in a sin-deprived world, that depraved world, and, and therefore we are going to fall into sin. We don't need to be like Adam and make another commitment. What we need to do is surrender and say, God, whatever you want me to do, I'm yours. I'm not qualified. I'm not good enough. But God, through Christ, through that sanctification process, through that righteous robe that we have on us, when you look on me, what you see is sinless, And you can take this vessel, you can do anything you want to with it. I don't know where you've been, what you've done, how long you've been away from God, but if you're a born-again believer, when God looks on you, he sees the righteousness of his son Jesus. He doesn't see the sin. Do you hear me? He sees the righteousness of his son Jesus. God can do anything he wants with us if we simply surrender. A naval, a great naval battle... After a great naval battle, a French admiral came uh, into Admiral Nelson's battleship to surrender with his hands outstretched. But Nelson said this. Admiral Nelson said, your sword first, please. What he's saying is this. Before you and I can embrace the Lord Jesus, we have to lay down our swords. We have to be willing to stick our hands up in the air in total surrender. Put away our agendas. Pry your fingers away from the things that we clench to. It's only then that we've surrendered and know Jesus is Lord of it all. Here's a question that I have for you tonight. Is God asking you to lay something down for the cause of Christ tonight? Don't don't answer it out loud. Ask yourself, what is it in your life that God's calling you to lay down so you can become the most dangerous, daring disciple of all time. Like the rich young ruler holding to his riches or Abraham holding fast to his promised son. God, ask us the very same thing tonight. Are we willing to lay down those precious treasures, those things that we value the most? I have to tell you 
that just a few years ago, my son Brian, who sits right here, Brian is uh, 36, going on 37, and when we lived in Ocala, Florida, he became very sick. They thought he had leukemia, and uh, he lost about 60 or 70 pounds over about nine months, had to live with us, quarantined because his children having germs and all. His white blood cell count went to about a little less than 1,000, and we literally thought we were about to lose Brian. And I, I don't know if you're okay with this, but just hear this preacher's heart. I sat in my hot tub out on my back lanai, and I fussed at God night after night after night. And here's why. I had made a promise to God that, God, if you will watch over my children and you'll watch over my wife, then I will live a single-minded, focused life dedicated to just preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And now all of a sudden, in my opinion, he wasn't keeping his end of the deal, and I'm ticked at God. Are y'all okay so far? But God, through that journey, not only healed my son, but brought his daddy to a point where I thought I had surrendered my kids to the Lord. But I said these words, God, if you need Brian Wade more than I need him, then take him. But you're going to have to prop me up. Because I'm going to be all jacked up. I'll be a mess. It was then that God began to heal my son. Until we're willing to surrender and let go of the things that we think we control, we can't be the disciple that God has called us to be. Ask God tonight to reveal these areas that are the toughest for you to give up. It could be family. It could be relationships. It could be finances. It could be your possession. It could be your job. It could be your health. It could be your habits. But when it comes to your family, once you surrender them to Jesus, I want to take just a minute, and Brody has asked me to do this, and share with you some practical ways that I have discipled my family over the years. Now, y'all look this way. I am the least among you. I don't have time to get into my story, and I don't want to glorify my past. But this is the guy that when God found him, or when he found God, and when he saw he had a need for God, was into more drugs and alcohol than I, can, than I have time to explain to you. I was physically beating my wife, the mother of my children. But when God restored my life, he began to restore my family. And all I want to do is to share with you a few of the things that we were able to practice as a family that I hope can help you become the disciple that God's called you to be. One of those things... It's simply the ministry of presence. When you're home, be at home. What we need to understand is the very woman that we set to the side while we chase everything else will be the woman that will clean our behinds when we get sick and old and everybody else is gone. Your children one day aren't going to grow up and say, Dad, it was so awesome to see you minister to all those people. But what about us? But what about us? I'll never forget coaching Brian in baseball. And one day Brian said, Dad, when, when did I get my dad back? I'm tired of the coach. I want my dad back. When you're at home, be at home. Spend time with your family. Make time with your family. I, I know we men struggle being, maybe you're not like this, but I am the most non-romantic person on planet Earth. Man, I, I, think, I think a box of chocolate and a Diet Coke for Valentine's is a great gift. <laughs> that don't settle real well all the time with my wife, okay? So I can't help you in those areas, but I can tell you that more than any expensive gift, what your wife and your children need is you. It's called the ministry of presence. Be there. Be there. Maybe your family's busted. Maybe you're, you're from a shattered home and, and you get your kids every so often. When you have them, be there for them. A second thing would be the ministry of prayer. Let your kids in on your struggles. I'm not saying on all of them, but every time when we struggled financially, and boy, we did, didn't we? Brian and Meredith would come and say, Dad, but I want this kind of shoes or I want this. And we would have to look them in the face and say, guys, we don't have the money. We're struggling to make a house payment. Would you join us in the living room and let's pray together over this? Watch this. 
You're saying, but Phil, you're loading them down with undue pressure. Y'all look this way. We wasn't putting the pressure on them. We're simply wanting them to pray with us to watch God work the miracle. And when he did, they got to see it. To the point that when Meredith Wade wanted to come up here, Meredith Lane now, we were living in St. Augustine. She said, Dad, I know I've got the Bright Future Scholarship to go to school right here in Florida, and it's paid for 100%, but I want to go to Andrews, North Carolina, and go to school. I said, that's out-of-state tuition. That ain't happening. She said, but, Dad, that's what I want to do. I said, well, I'll tell you what. She, no, she said, Dad, I, I believe God could work out the finances. I said, well, what makes you think that? Well, he's worked out years in mom's finances all these years. We've prayed and we've watched him do it. I said, well, I'll tell you what, you and God worked that out and let me know how it goes. <laughs> she made a trip to North Carolina. Snowbird paid for her first year of college. By the end of that first year, she's now a resident, and she got a free ride. And what wasn't a free ride, Snowbird paid for. I know some of you are thinking, write that down. <laughs> Snowbird will pay my kids way to school. <laughs> I didn't say that. But what I'm telling you, when you <laughs> <coughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Go back to your perch. <coughs> you scared me. I didn't even know you was there, boy. You snuck up on me. <laughs> what I'm telling you is when you, when you teach your kids to be a part of asking God for a miracle and he does it, then they begin to believe he'll do it for them. That one was laying sick on his deathbed. And he prayed, God, I don't care who you bring to mom and dad's house to pray over me. Please send somebody but heal me. A lady knocks on my door 30 minutes after he prayed that. And I didn't know he prayed it. And said, God's called me to come pray for your son. Are you okay with it? I said, well, absolutely. She goes over and begins to pray over my son. The very same day that I prayed that, to God that I would release him. Listen. Teach your kids. Bring them in on the journey of your prayer life. Teach them. Thirdly, the ministry of mission. Take them on a mission trip. My daughter was probably one of the most materialistic people you've ever met until she got to Aldama, Mexico. And that's where God called her to the mission field. If you're tired of your kids wanting and wanting and wanting and wanting, pay the money and send them on a mission trip. It'll save you a whole lot of money later down the road. I'm just telling you, and you'll watch God do a mighty work. And then the ministry of parents versus friend. Y'all look this way. As a pastor, I cannot tell you the number of appointments that I have in my office that parents are still breastfeeding 40 and 50-year-old kids. And it's because they won't allow them to grow up. You, you, you better be their parent first. And age is not, is not the point. They could be 40 or 50 and still not grown up. If you don't want 40 and 50-year-old breastfeeders on your wife, you better teach them to get out and get it with God. My son decided he didn't want to be in college anymore. And I knew that because I'd been checking on his grades. The only thing he was passing was flag football. Then he calls me one day and says, Dad, I don't want to upset you, but I, I, want to, I want to come home. School's not for me. I said, I know it's not. Come on, I got you two gifts. He said, tonight? I said, yep, come on. He's going to Baptist College of Florida. He got home and he said, hey, you got my gifts? I said, I do. Here's a car payment book and an insurance payment book. And in 30 days, you will start paying rent at this house. And he said, but Dad, I've called Pop Pop, my father, in Rome, and he wants me to come to work for him. I said, I'll help you pack. Was I trying to get rid of my son? No. I was trying to teach my son that dad's not going to be around forever to take care of him. Be a parent. Be a parent. The friendship will come. And then the ministry of transparency. If all you share with your kids is your strengths, then you build walls that they can't cross over. I'll never be that. I'll never be able to do it. But if you'll share your weaknesses, you build bridges for your kids to cross over. For me to go to my kids and say, your dad has blown it. He's been abusive. He's been ugly. I'm sorry. My wife said, your kids are afraid of you, and if you will go and ask them without responding to them when they tell you what you don't want to hear, then go get the truth. She said, but if you lash out at them, she said, the mama bear's coming out. Listen, I'm afraid of my wife. I'm just going to tell you all straight up. She can be crazy. 
And I went to them and I said, are y'all scared of your dad? And they said, yes. And it was then I had the opportunity to ask my children to forgive me. The ministry of transparency will take you further down the road than you've ever been. And then the ministry of forgiveness. Forgive and ask forgiveness. Everybody say these words. I'm sorry. Everybody say these words. Please forgive me. Say these words. I forgive you. Nobody in here died of a cardiac arrest. But it's the hardest words for men to say. Listen to me. Say, say I'm sorry. Be willing to forgive. And then the ministry of leadership. Y'all look this way one more time. Live what you preach. Live what you preach. And when you blow it, confess it. Admit it to your kids. I'm sorry I blew that with you. I'm sorry. Be willing to be transparent. Be willing to lead your family. Let's admit, though, we struggle with surrender. We struggle with forgiveness. We struggle with forgiving ourselves, don't we? It's a tough one. It's the, listen, it's the biggest problem, and it's, it's the greatest problem I believe there has ever been, is the problem of forgiveness. I believe the lack of forgiveness or unforgiveness probably keeps more people from operating in their potential than any other thing. Because when you hold on to unforgiveness towards somebody else, you find out that there's a prisoner and you're it. And you find out when you say, I'm sorry, or you forgive somebody that you set a prisoner free to only find out that you're it. Forgiveness. You, you've got to listen. It's in the lives of singles and married and old people and young people, men and women and leaders and followers. It has the power to leave us feeling frustrated and, and, and unable and un overwhelmed and discouraged because we're consumed. We're asphyxiated on that pain or that anger of somebody who's hurt us. It causes us to miss the answers that are right in front of us and go for answers that are nowhere near what we need to be looking to. It has the power to put your Bible on the shelves instead of in your heart and in your hand because all of a sudden you don't feel worthy. You're afraid maybe God's mad at you. Y'all look this way. God's not mad at you. God knew you were going to do it before you did it. When you confess your sin, you're not getting God in on the no. He already knows. You're just lining yourself up with what God already knows. It turns us into passive and somewhat cynical waiters just hanging around waiting on the next good thing to happen rather than taking a risk and going out and watching God rock your world. It changes the way you think about yourself and the way you make decisions. You say, so Phil, what's the problem? Well, I didn't think you'd ever ask. It's the fact that so many of us have a huge dark hole in the middle of our gospel. We've got a huge, a, a huge misunderstanding or a huge part that's missing when it comes to the gospel. We have, we have a, a pretty good understanding of the gospel past. That's the, the forgiveness that, that we have received through the sacrifice of Jesus. And we have a pretty good understanding of the forgiveness future. That salvation, the, the eternity that we'll spend with Jesus. But we, we really need to understand the benefits of the work of Christ in the here and in the now. Now, you may want to write this down. While Jesus has saved us from the consequences of our sin, he is still saving us from the affliction of our sin. Think about that. He has saved us from the consequences of sin, but we're in the process of being saved from the affliction. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're not going to be afflicted by sin because we live in a sin-filled world. So to think that I'm saved and it's all going to be peachy is a lie from hell. Because we still live in this sin-sick world. The Bible powerfully declares that Jesus didn't just die for the past. He didn't just die for our future, but he died for all things that we face even right now. The reason that's important to know, because you can't move forward in the power of Christ as a believer if we're stuck in the past of our sin and our guilt and our shame. God has forgiven, but we've got to learn to forgive ourselves. 
We've got to learn to let go of the past. God has. We're the ones that's holding on to it. Listen to Galatians 2.20. Turn there in your Bibles and we're done. <coughs> I want you to listen to the present tense gospel in the words of Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. A famous verse we all know could probably quote it by heart. And here's what he says. I have been crucified with Christ. That's a statement of historical redemptive fact. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. That's a statement of redemptive reality. And then he says, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's living in the light of the gospel right here and right now. So let me read it to you again. For I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ who lives within me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Though we're saved, though we're redeemed, though we're clothed in his righteousness, we're still walking out a sanctification process in this sin-filled world. Are y'all with me? Stop beating yourself up over it. Admit where you are. Understand where you are. Embrace where you are. And then begin to ask God to continue that sanctification process that you might become that dangerous and daring disciple that he's called you to be. And it doesn't mean that every day you get up you're going to want to do what he says to do. But that's beside the point. It's not a matter of wanting to. It's a matter of doing it regardless of how we feel. That's what he's saying. So what does the gospel say that we have been given right here, right now, so that we can be all that he's called us to be and do all that he's called us to do? Here it is. Here's the drum roll. The answer is Jesus. Not your own effort. Not my own effort. Not your past. Not my past. Not my ability toward the future. Not your ability toward the future. But Christ. Y'all look this way. He's enough. Christ is enough. He's in you. He's with you. He's for you. In Christ, you really do have everything you need. You, you really do. You simply have not been left to yourself, the old Adam. Aren't you grateful? He's enough. He's with you. But as I close, close your Bibles and I want you to just listen to me. But if we're going to embrace that, let me bring you to the final summation of what we got to do. If we're going to be dangerous and daring disciples, we've got to embrace that it's not about anything we can do or have done. It's about everything he's done, and we embrace that, and we walk in his righteousness. But in order to do that, you have to be transparent about where you are right now. If you're not saved, then in order to be a disciple of Christ, you have to trust Christ as your Savior. But if you are a born-again believer, then you have to ask yourself the question, where are you in this discipleship pathway if you will. In 2015, I was probably in the darkest journey of my pastoring years and didn't know it. I, I, I didn't even know what depression was. I'd never been depressed. If you'd asked me to define it, I couldn't. I finally went to see a counselor and he said, Phil, are you depressed? I said, I wouldn't know what it looks like. But if me not wanting to do ministry anymore... I'm not having a heart for anybody. I don't care about my family. I don't care about nothing. It means I'm depressed, and yes, sir, I'm depressed. Well, it was at that time that I grabbed my Bible, a notepad, and a book, and I headed to the Blue Ridge Mountains to get in a cabin by myself that some people had paid for for me to get away. And I began, when I got there, to write a letter to God because I just wanted to be honest about where I was. Again, I wasn't getting him in on the no. He already knew. I was simply wanting to confess to him, God, this is where I am. I'm going to ask the musicians to come on, man. We'll, we'll get started. Let me just read you, if you don't mind, the letter I wrote to God. It said, Lord, I come tired and empty and frustrated, and my deceitful heart says to run away and quit. My selfish heart says I no longer care who's hurting or how much they're hurting because right now I'm hurting. And though I know it's a lie from hell and my own fault for not sharing with someone, I feel that no one gives a expletive. 
I'll not say it because there's some kids in here. But like I said, I had to get honest with God. Then I'm drowning while everyone else continues to suck the life out of me. I'm spending zero time with my wife and my children and my ministry team. And most importantly, you. And as a result, my relationship with Kelly is strained at best. And with my children and the ministry team, it's non-existent. I find myself going about my day with you as my backup, and to be honest, I'm so, somewhat ashamed. That's why I'm here. I'm at the end of myself, so much so that I'm trying to guard my mind from the return of addictions, pulling at me on a daily basis. I'm so ashamed at even the thought of it that I have no control at this moment. You know I love you, and I'm surrendered to serve you forever, and it's as though I've allowed serving you to take precedence over being with you. I had prostituted myself to the church. I had whored myself out to the church instead of Jesus. I was busy serving him, but I wasn't spending any time with him. Dad, I'm crying out to you to reveal to me the things that have, that have derailed me. Show me my fault. Show me the way out. Give me strength to withstand the giants and temptations, the lies of Satan that keep me from self-destruction and keep me from self-destruction mentally and physically. Father, they say that Satan only attacks those who are a threat to his kingdom of darkness, and I pray that that's true, but I'm tired. I take full responsibility for where I'm at, but I trust that you will lead me out. I believe that this too will pass, but please allow me to learn so I don't return to this place. As you reveal my sin, I'll confess it. I'll repent, and I'll leave the superficial life. I so desire to find myself back by your side, pursuing the destiny that you have for me and my wife and my family and my ministry team and our church family. I'm ready to return to the joy of your salvation, to laugh again. Speak to me. Reveal truth. Show me the truth. Give me vision. Give me direction. And while I'm not doing a good job of leading my family and team and the sheep, thank you for being the ultimate shepherd. Your wayward child, Phil. That guy that I just described... It's not a dangerous and daring disciple. That's not the way I wanted to end. But what I can tell you, though it's not the way I wanted to end, that before you can become a dangerous and daring disciple, you are going to have to be that transparent if that's where you are. Even if you're not that deep in depression, even if you're not even depressed, the question we have to ask is, where are we in the discipleship pathway with Jesus? You got to be real. You've got to be honest. You've got to be transparent. And before you can be that with God and before you can be that with your family, you've got to be that with yourself. The best biblical definition of discipleship is not explained by virtue of the starting line, but by virtue of the finish line. It's not how you started. It's how you'll finish. James chapter 1 my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, listen, produces patience. But let patience have its a perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's Christ. That's not in the old Adam. That's in Christ. Y'all look this way and I'm done. It's a dirty work. It's dirty. Pouring into people. And loving people and loving your family and laying your agenda to the side is dirty work. It's tough work. It requires that we stop running from trials and embrace the fact that it's in the trials that we're made perfect and we're complete in Jesus. There's an old country song that I'll leave you with. Rascal Flats sings it. And he says, and when they carve my stone... They'll write these words. Here lies a man who lived life for all that it's worth. I'm going to stop looking back, start moving on, learn how to face my fears, love with all of my heart, make my mark. I want to leave something here. Go out on a ledge without any net. That's what I'm going to be about. I want to be running when the sand runs out. That's my story. 
And if you're going to be a dangerous and daring disciple, you're going to have to be willing to lay your agenda to the side and embrace what it is that God has for you. Get to the back of the line and serve your family first and other people second. God's called you to a great work. And you can make a difference, but you can't make a difference at the front of the line, and you can't make a difference until you get honest about where you are. If you don't know Jesus tonight, find one of us. We'll be around. Talk to somebody tonight. Embrace the Savior. No longer in Adam, it's time to be in Christ. No longer the old man, let him be passed away. Embrace the new, embrace Jesus and become more than you ever dreamed possible and go disciple your family and make a difference in this world. Father, in Jesus' name, change our hearts, change our lives. May we surrender completely every fiber of our being. May we lay down whatever stands in the way of what you've called us to be and what you've called us to do. May we be willing to lay it at the feet of Jesus and never, ever again pick it up. In Jesus' name.